Good to see you on Friday night. Welcome to Missions Conference Friday evening. We're looking forward to a great service together tonight. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I think it was 2012 when we first met the Callahans, and uh, they were here, must have been on a furlough then, and um, it was the same summer I was having both uh, my hips replaced six weeks apart. And uh, Brother Callahan stepped in and uh, filled the pulpit for us during that time. And uh, that's when our church really got to know them. And um, uh, he did a tremendous job for us. And uh, he's pastor of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Japan, uh, 16 years. And uh, someone said, how many churches have you pastored in Japan? He was telling us. He said, five. He said, oh, you move around? He said, no, it's the same one. Just five different churches because of their turnover. It's a military church, and so you only get, get them for two or three years, and then they're shipped out to somewhere else. And so when they, really, when they come back to the States, it's kind of fun because they get to see folks from their church all over the United States uh, who they influence. I could not do what they do. Uh, it, I, I, don't, I don't care what pastors tell you. It, it hurts whenever anybody leaves your church. Uh, whether they move away or whether they leave because they're upset with you, it still hurts. And I don't like losing anybody. And uh, I can't imagine what it would be to see a turnover of your church every couple years. And uh, But this is what uh, the ministry God's called them to, and God has used them to see many of our military come to know Christ as their Savior. And they've been in it long enough now, even though it's only been 20 years, they're, they're, they're the babies of this conference and that's 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 unusual. Usually, they're you know with people called to the mission field right out of college, and they're the elder statesmen of the group. But not so in this conference. And uh, but it's great to have them here tonight. And uh, Brother Callahan, you come, and uh, you take the next forty minutes or so, and uh, you have a presentation and preaching, whatever you want to do, and uh, you fill that time up, brother. You know, God calls personalities, uh, and I tell people, you know, I couldn't do what he's doing. Because in three years, I'd be looking at you going, one of us got to go. <laughs> but, you know, all joking aside, though, what he talked about is coming back to the States and getting to see people that was in our church in Japan now serving in America. Amen? The Walters in Ellensburg, Washington. Amen? The Wigleys in Austin, Texas. Uh, the Bosbergs in Virginia Beach, and I mean from coast to coast, and now the world. Uh, we've got uh, an associate pastor out in California, two men in the pastorate today, uh, Sunday school teachers and youth pastors all over the world. So it's really neat for us, and that's what keeps us doing what we're doing. Amen? But uh, we'll go ahead and start with the slide presentation now. Uh, I get as, a lot of time, so I'm going to just take my time through the slides. Amen? We are the Callahans to the U.S. military in Japan. You know my wife, Susan, and our son, Jonathan. Amen? This is what we looked like in 2002. Amen? This is our oldest daughter, Heather. She now lives in Bel Air, Maryland with her husband, Aaron, and their little baby named Autumn. Their last name is Day. Autumn Day. Let's go. Amen? Amen? And this is my son, uh, Nathan. If you have a progressive insurance and get in trouble, he's one of your... Uh, representatives up there in Austin, Texas. Amen. And then this is Matthew. And Matthew and his wife, Jessica, lives in Tenino, Washington. And they are in the car right now leaving the hospital with their brand new baby, Michael Lee Callahan. Amen. I uh, was born two days ago. So we were excited. Our family's growing. Amen. And then these two right here, Catherine and Seth. Now, Maryland, Texas, Washington, they're in Florida. Amen? And uh, so, and that, that, that young man right there, that's him right there, that baby. Amen? <laughs> but I'll let you know, Catherine and Seth are in Florida in college down there. Catherine's uh, studying nursing, and my son is one to be a history teacher slash uh, coach. Amen? So he's majoring in uh, physical education. Uh, this is our sending church, Hillcrest Baptist Church in El Paso, Texas. Now, I am a Buckeye. My wife's a Buckeye. We were born here, but I retired from Fort Bliss, Texas. That's how I ended up in El Paso. About the only way you end up in El Paso. Amen? <laughs> but, uh, amen. So uh, that's our ascending church, So Hill Crest Baptist Church. That's our pastor, Pastor Joe Dickinson, and his wife, Tish. And this is my life verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 
uh, 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen? And the reason that means so much to me is because 40 years ago, that was me. Amen? I had joined the United States Army right out of Lancaster, uh, oh, here in Ohio, spent 20 years in the United States Army, but it was in 1986 as a star sergeant station in Gießen, Germany, that my wife said, I want to go to church. Now, I didn't grow up in church. I never really went to church. Church to me was weddings and funerals, amen? And, but she said she wanted to go to church. You see, she graduated from Worldly High School, Catholic high school here. She went to Baptist churches, Episcopalian churches. She's just confused, right, Mr. Net? Amen? But anyway, and uh, that's her cousin, if you don't know that, amen? But uh, so uh, she, she said she wanted to go to church. So I went, and uh, we went to the military chapel, just like most people would. Now, I'm not going to slam the military chapels. Uh, they, chaplains are trying to do the best they can, but quite honestly, you don't know the doctrinal stance of most chaplains, amen? The chaplain over at NAF at Sugi, where we were for 13 years, was a Mormon for three years. He, uh, chief chaplain was a Mormon, so they don't see this Christ as we see Christ, amen? So that's what you run into at military chaplains. By the way, we've been commanded to start New Testament local churches, amen? So we went home, and my wife went to that drawer. You, you guys, your wife have that drawer that you're scared to go into, amen? <laughs> right? My wife had one of those, and she went in there, and she pulled a track out of there, and I said, what's that? And she said somebody had put them in the laundry room on the washers and dryers, and she picked up one of those tracks, and she said, let's go to this church. I said, that's a German church. We won't know anything there, amen? And so she talked me into going there, and lo and behold, we walk in, a bunch of Americans in there, amen? The only German that was in there was Mrs. Smart, and she was married to a soldier, amen? So we went there, and we listened to the preaching. And I'd never heard that stuff before. Uh, I'd been to a church that I thought was kind of wild, but I went into this church, and the guy opened the Bible and said, so saith the Lord, amen? And kind of uh, got my attention. But his enthusiasm and excitement afterwards is what got me. He came and said, you've got to come back. I'm not the preacher. You've got to come back. And I was like, man, you're in church. Chill out, amen? And Because uh, I didn't know what he was excited about. But we went back and we listened to his preacher, and it was on May 29, 1986, at 9B Lunar Garden Strasse, apartment 18, that a missionary come knocking on our door, amen? And he didn't knock on a door of somebody that was going to be a missionary or a youth pastor or a trustee or an usher or anything else. He knocked on the door of somebody that needed to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And on that night, about 7.30, me and my wife both bowed our heads at a coffee table and accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Amen? 2014, we were up on mainland for 13 years uh, near Tokyo, and the uh, Lord had started working on our hearts. And in 2014, I was wondering what God was doing in our lives. And my wife said, you need to get away for, uh, for a little while. How, you guys, you need to listen to your wife sometimes, amen? Uh, they, they're pretty smart people. And she said, you need to get away for a little while. So I took a trip down to Okinawa. And I called one of my friends uh, to tell him I'm leaving cold Tokyo and going down to warm Okinawa, amen? Uh, in Okinawa, it hits 50 degrees. Everybody's in coat and gloves, amen? So it's a pretty warm place. And we go down, and I go down there, and the first thing he asked me, are you going down to start a church? And I was like, what do you mean, start a church? There's churches down there. I don't need to go down there. I get down there, and I attend an independent Baptist church, and the pastor said, can I talk to you afterwards? And I said, sure, and I talked to him afterwards. You know what his question was? Are you here to start a church? <laughs> How many of you are hard-headed? <laughs> Amen. I said, no, haven't even thought about it. Amen. So I went to the missionary's house that I was staying with, and Brother Dan said, or have you considered coming down here and starting a church? And I asked him why. Amen? There's three bases down here, uh, Camp Kinzer, Fatimna Air Station, and Camp Kinzer. There used to be a bunch of churches down here, but I found out two of them had closed. Two of them had moved up north. And uh, so I was like, what's going on? And what's going on is Fatimna and Kinzer is closing. So everybody was moving up north to where the soldiers and sailors and airmen are at. And that left this big gap down there with no Bible preaching church. But the problem is, remember I told you I was in Giessen? I was there from 84 to 87. You know what I heard? They're closing Giessen. Went back there in 90. Guess what? They're closing Giessen. In 2005 or something like that, they finally closed Giessen. So I know this, as long as those gates are open, they need a Bible-believing church. Amen? By the way, since we've been down there, Kinzer has gotten a 20-year extension, and Fatimna is nowhere close to closing. Amen? 
So for at least the next 20 years, those bases are going to be there. But in 2014, 52,000 U.S. military stationed in Japan. Now you've got to figure with, uh, with families, with civilian workers, and contractors, and everything else, you're talking well over 150,000 people in Japan, amen? But what you might not know is 27,000 of them are on a little island called Okinawa, amen? 70 miles long and about 10 miles wide, and there's 27,000 U.S. military down there. When you start talking about uh, families and everything else, just between the three bases, Kinzer, Fatimin, and Foster, we can reach out to over 14,000 souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? Just on three bases, but as you can tell, there's a lot of bases. Because in, Oka, uh, in Japan, Okinawa makes up only 6% of the nation's uh, landmass, but 62% of all bases are in Okinawa. And that's a lot of people down there, amen? So, Yokoso, Okinawa, Nippon. Welcome to Okinawa, Japan, amen? A lot of people ask me as a retired military guy, what's one of my biggest benefits? Is it medical? Is it commissary? Is it PX? What, what's your biggest benefit? And I always tell them it's these gates here. Because if I can't get through those gates, nothing else is available. Amen? But as a retiree, I can get right through those gates. Amen? And this is the main gate at Camp, or one of the gates at Camp Foster. This is uh, Marine Corps Air Station Fatimna. Anybody know what an Osprey is? It's an aircraft that takes off like a helicopter, then the wings fold. They're at Fatimna. We live right behind the back gate of Fatimna. They fly right over our house all the time. Amen? Some people call it noise. We call it the sound of freedom. Amen? And then uh, this is uh, Camp Kinzer, and everybody was telling me this base was closed, but that gate and another gate was just built, multi-million dollar gates, which tells me it's not closing anytime soon, amen? But once we get to those gates, we get to what you call an apartment building, but we call towers, amen? At Camp Kinzer alone, there's 11 of these towers. And we figured up a husband, wife, and one kid, that's 3,902 people living just in these towers on one base, Amen? with no Bible-believing uh, church down there. So we uh, determined to go down there. Then you have these garden apartments or, or duplexes, whatever you want to call them. We call them garden apartments. And, and there's a lot of these around there, too, with uh, families living in there. And there's also barracks over there, amen? So on 11 July 2015, we got to Okinawa, Japan, with a plan, amen? And we're going to start a church about 2016. How many of you ever told God your plan and they laughed at it? Amen? <laughs> I want you to follow this timeline really close. We got there on July 11th. On July 22nd, we got our household goods. Right after that, we got phone calls asking when our first services were going to be. Amen? So I called the gar uh, gardeners together, father and son. He's a uh, brother Dan on the right is a second generation missionary. On August 1st, we had our very first prayer meeting determining when we were going to start the church, right? August 2nd, we put our sign up. We've been there less than three weeks, and we had our first service. Amen? This is what our service looked like. We're in the uh, dining room, looking out at the uh, living room, and to the left is our kitchen. Amen? My son was leading songs, and this is what our first service looked like. We had seven people. Uh, but this is Deb and Steve. They're the ones that called us, and praise God, they were from Foundations Baptist Church, uh, another independent Baptist church on the island. And they became our first members, and Lighthouse Baptist Church was established on, on August 2nd, 2015, right behind MCAS Fatimna. Uh, we claimed the, the verse, let us rise up and build out Nehemiah 2.18, and then they became our first members, amen? And God has just richly started blessing us from there, because she brought this lady to church, her name's Holly, and Holly was a uh, Catholic for over 50 years, taught in Catholic high schools, Amen teaching psychology on base, but she got saved, amen? And I love somebody like that because she asked a lot of awesome questions, amen? But what happened, though, she became our first baptism, amen? And now we baptize in what's known as Raha Beach, and you'll get a better picture of it later. But we go down to the beach, and I've told the church if we ever get a building big enough for a baptism, we're not going to build one because this is an awesome thing. What you can't see, there's a walkway up there, and people, uh, Japanese and Americans, are walking by there all the time. Every time we have a baptism, we we draw a crowd, amen? And uh, the, some people said, these are the longest baptisms we've ever had, amen? Because I'm down there, I'm preaching the gospel, amen? And so we have a good time, though. And uh, Don, now, what I want to let you know, uh, I'm going to tell you stories about some people, 
Because I want Bible Baptist Church to know where their missions dollar is going. Amen? It's going to see people like this come to know Christ. But the stories I tell you can be told over and over and over. Amen? These are just a representation of a lot of people. Amen? But Don grew up in a Christian home, knew God as a Savior, knew Christ as a Savior, a bit backslidden through the military, and now he's a civilian worker on Okinawa. And his wife gets saved. He starts coming back to church, rededicates his life, and now they're serving the Lord together. Uh, God's got great, such a great sense of humor. It took him from Okinawa, Japan, to Alaska. Amen? So that's where they're at now. But then I'm sitting at the commissary, uh, and, and I have a sign on the side of the, my van that says Lighthouse Baptist Church. This guy comes knocking on our window, amen? Says, hey, where's your church at? Amen? They became our third members, amen? And then start, God just started growing the church. Here's some of the kids. And then just a few months, this was the class, amen? And God just started growing the, the church and doing some awesome things. This was our BBS last year, amen? So as you can see, God has rapidly grown the church, but the military work always goes through transition. So as we go through the slides, you'll see what I mean, amen? But this was our BBS last year. And then uh, we just do normal things like a lot of people do. This is our men's prayer breakfast, amen? And then what do military guys do for activity? They go out and shoot each other. Amen? <laughs> this is a paintballing activity. As you notice, the preacher did not get out of it. But being retired army, I shot back. Amen? <laughs> so this, this is what we do. Amen? And then we had a, a lady. My wife used to go to Newark Baptist Temple. Uh, I'm sorry for you not Ohioans. Newark Baptist Temple. And uh, she used to go down there when I was deployed and stuff. And we met uh, Miss Marie Nichols. And when we were back to the States in 2012, she actually taught our uh, kids piano for a while. And she got a burden for our, our um, church, and she actually came over with five young people and did a music camp for us, amen, which was a great outreach to the community and all those things. And then this is my son learning the cello, amen. And then this was a big concert we had at the end. And it was such a blessing to see the big turnout that we had and able to reach out to people with the gospel through music, amen. Now, this is a very, very special uh, ministry that we have. Uh, if you want to earn some money, you can come over to Japan and teach English. Amen? And like me, you don't, really don't have to speak it that well. Amen? But they want, they, they want teachers, and they, they cost us, we'll spend a lot of money to get teachers. Amen? So my wife said, why don't we have English lessons at the church for free? I said, that's awesome. Amen? So for a lot of years up on mainland, she had a Bible study. Uh, I'm sorry, an English lesson, amen, that was taught in conjunction with the Bible. Because at the end of every class, she gives a Bible story and gives the gospel, amen. She saw three Japanese ladies come to know Christ as Savior through these English lessons, amen. But this is her current class. And what, what, what I'm jealous about is they keep calling her, asking her when she's coming back. My church hasn't called me yet asking me when I'm coming back, right? <laughs> right? And what's really exciting, she's actually had two ladies call that haven't been to her class saying, when are you coming back? We want to come to your class. Amen? So this is a, a great opportunity for us. I'll be up in my office sometimes, and they'll be laughing, and, and I'll go down and find out what they're, they're doing, and she's got some stories for you that, that are just hilarious. Amen? Uh, but this is our, our living room there where the class is. So we decided to take them bowling. Amen? And the thing was, we went on base, and some of our church family came out and was with us, and the rule was you couldn't speak English Japanese. You only could speak English, right? And then we got to the bowling alley and realized that most of the cashiers are Japanese. Amen? So we had to go tell these Japanese ladies they couldn't speak Japanese to the Japanese ladies. Amen? They could only speak English. And it really turned out great. But what happened with this is something that we've never happened, uh, have happened before. This guy right there just got out of the military. He's married to her. And uh, he's looking for a job on base. Now, he has a job on base, so he'll be there when we get back. And I was able to witness to him and give him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So this may be a new door that's opening for us. We'll be able to reach husbands also. Amen? Now, this young lady, I'm going to go through some stories here. And like I said, this can be told over and over. But this was a unique story. Uh, we're up in the commissary. My son's got a Lighthouse Baptist Church polo shirt on. And somebody named Blake come up and asked him, hey, where's your church? And they're sitting there talking. He said, well, you need to talk to my dad. So I come walking up, and we just got a couple minutes to talk, and then he went through the checkout line. And I thought, man, I hope I run into him again and get to see him again. Go out the door. He's out there waiting for me. Amen? 
And he tells me how his wife dragged him to church and how he got saved and baptized. And now they were looking for a church, right? So they came to our church for a while visiting and I did a follow-up on them. And then uh, when they became more faithful, I, I went to them to talk about church membership. So I'm talking to Blake and I said, Blake, tell me how you got saved and how you got baptized. He told me his testimony, good testimony, everything lined up, it was good. Then I looked at his wife, Cherish, and I said, Cherish, tell me how you got saved. She goes, I'm not saved. Blake about had a heart attack, amen? And I'm sitting there going, excuse me? I just heard a testimony how you dragged him to church, how you insisted you guys go to church together. She goes, yeah, but nobody ever asked me. Did you catch that? Amen? I was a, that was an eye-opener, wasn't it? Amen? Can I tell you that wasn't the first time that's happened to me? Is that awesome? But then I said, ma'am, I'd like to ask you a question. And she said yes to receiving Jesus Christ as her personal Savior, right? Now, I told you we, we go down to Raja Beach. You notice how dark it is? We have our services on Thursday night. This was Wednesday night. She dragged us down to the water Thursday night after church and wanted to follow the Lord in baptism. Amen? So that's her being baptized. And then this guy here is from Troy, Ohio. Uh, sometimes people will write us and say, my son, my daughter, my mom, dad, relative, somebody's stationed over there. Would you go look for them? which normally means they've come to Okinawa, they're not in church, and they want us to go find them. Amen? Don't bother us one bit. I hunt them down. Amen? But in this case, they sent me some phone numbers, so I texted them on Saturday morning. Just a few minutes later, they texted me back, and ne next day they were in church. Amen? And Johnny's testimony is this. His wife grew up in uh, Troy, Ohio. They went to an independent Baptist church out there. She grew up in church. She saved. Uh, but he got, he got saved right before he joined the Air Force and before they got married. So he never followed the Lord in baptism. And I asked him, I said, Johnny, you, you need to be baptized. He, he said, yes, I do, sir, but I want to wait. And that kind of makes me nervous sometimes when they say I want to wait. Amen? Until he told me why he wanted to wait. Because what you can't see, you remember that, that beach I told you about? His mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa are up on that beach watching him be baptized. Amen? He wanted to wait till his family got there. And so we had the pleasure of having the, his, his mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa there watch during his baptism. But you know something? The Lord always has a plan that we don't see. You know what I mean? Because this lady just happened to visit our church that day. She's Okinawan. And she uh, was sitting there watching the baptism. And then she came up to my wife and said, people have witnessed me. People have told me about Jesus Christ and everything. I never understood until I saw the baptism. And she says, now I understand. And my wife very diligently took her through the plan of salvation. She bowed her head and accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Amen? Remember Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, and said, what hindereth me to be baptized? Amen? That's exactly what she did. She walked right down the water and watched she had come to church in that day. I followed her and baptized her right there in the East China Sea. Amen? So God is really good. Amen? But this is uh, the, the precious moments of our ministry when the church starts growing, amen? That is Elijah Mark, the Old Testament, New Ta Testament, up in one bundle right there, amen? And uh, their family uh, is part of our church, and they come, and, and then this guy here, that's Grayson. Now, Grayson's very special to me because he never would come to me, and the minute he came to me, I got a picture taken. He never came to me again, amen? But I got the picture to prove it, Amen? But why is this picture, so, but why is Grayson so precious to me? Because of his family. This is Mark. Mark is from Trinidad. He came to America, became a U.S. citizen, joined the United States Marine Corps, and now uh, serving uh, God in Okinawa, or, or serving the military in Okinawa. And this is Melissa, his wife. Well, they came to our church, and I went to visit them, and at their call, kitchen table, they bowed their heads and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Amen. Came to know Christ. And then the following Sunday during invitation, their son got saved during invitation. Two weeks later, through uh, the junior church program we have, his, their other son got saved, amen? So I was able to baptize all four of those, uh, that family, amen? And that was just a unique and special moment for us. But you see now, Grayson is growing up in a home that knows Jesus Christ as her personal Savior, amen? He's growing up in a home, and they're in Hawaii now. So we've already got people going uh, around the world for us, amen? But this is the Aline family and Precious, but just like the pastor was saying, there they are, they're off and running, amen? And this is us saying goodbye to them there. Uh, but that just happens so many times and over and over. So that's just the way our ministry is, amen? 
But I'll tell you what, the joy of seeing things like that happen are just beyond description. See, a lot of times we'll get people overseas, and once they're away from family, away from familiar things, away from malls and all this other stuff, amen, Walmart, amen? Uh, we don't have Walmart. I know that's a shock. We suffer, amen? But anyway, <laughs> and so we're over there, and guess what? When they can get away and they, they connect with us, the Lord can do wonderful things, where maybe in the States He wouldn't, amen? So this is a great moment for us. Uh, this was my pastor. He came and visited last uh, February. Uh, this is our house. Now I want you to notice the feet in the kitchen, amen? And that's a normal church service for us. We have had people sitting on these steps here, amen? And uh, right now, we, you know, we've grown. We've, we've uh, had the big turnover and stuff, and we're back in our house. But one of the main things we want to do when we get back to Japan is, one, get a van because uh, in Okinawa, Marines aren't allowed to drive unless they're a certain rank or they're married uh, because of the amount of Marines and because of some of the trouble they get into, amen? And they can't leave the base without a buddy. Uh, they call it combat, uh, battle buddy. Well, I could go on base and become their battle buddy and get, get them to church, amen? And we're at that point where we want to start doing that, amen? Plus, we're going to be starting to look for a building that's suitable for our, our church. We've got about a core group of 20 people right now, amen? And there I am sharing a word with them. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 7 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Amen? Without you, those lives would not have been touched with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you come to a missions conference and say, ah, eh, what, what if I give anything, will it matter? To those lives, it mattered. Amen? And to me, it mattered because I didn't realize what it took for a man to come knock on my door in a place called Gießen, Germany, until I sat through a missions conference and realized what it took for him to come over there and tell me about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, how many of you in here know somebody in the military, was in the military, or, or something, you know? It's everybody, amen? And then we got a, a young lady back there, who, two brothers in the army, amen? So uh, I appreciate that. But each one of these have a story. Uh, every month I Skype services in Japan. This guy is my IT guy. His name is Simon. Pray for Simon. He's lost. Doesn't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. But he comes to church because, his, uh, because of his wife and two children. He never badmouths the church, never puts her down, supports her 100%. But every week I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. Amen. So pray for Simon. Uh, one of the most faithful people we have. Amen. Uh, this lady right here, we don't have just military coming to our church. She was born in Singapore, grew up in New Zealand, and then now is teaching English in, in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, she just got a year extension, so she'd be with us for a lot longer, amen? Uh, but, but it's awesome to have her in there with her Australian accent, amen? It's awesome. But I'll tell you what, we're reaching people that aren't uh, military also. Uh, this guy back here, uh, his name is Joe. Every time my wife would drop the kids off at work at the commissary, she'd yell, LFO, LFO, look for opportunity, right? Well, Joe is the head bagger on base. He's not part of the military, not a contract worker or anything. Just works on base, working for tips and stuff. And he brings his whole family to church, amen? Uh, this couple right here is Troy Ohio. That's Johnny and Riley. Lee. This is the Dave family. They're the ones that just had that little baby. Uh, this is Richard and Leslie, retired uh, military guy right there, nurse. He's now the caseworker for the U.S. Army up at the hospital. So these are people that you have had a part impacting for the cause of Christ, amen? As we celebrate what's happening in Okinawa, we celebrate here in Columbus and Grove City what's happening with Bible Baptist Church, amen? If you'd like to follow us and know more about our ministry, you can look us up at Lighthouse Baptist Church, Okinawa, amen? If you have your Bibles tonight, please open to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Got a real short um, uh, just a little challenge for you, amen? I uh, want to get Brother Miller up here quick. I enjoyed that last night, Brother Miller. Uh, Brother Fitz uh, Simmons, I'm glad I didn't have to follow you last night, amen? That was really good, amen? I mean, between the two, uh, if your blessing is broke, you didn't get nothing, but if you got a blessing on that's right, you got something, amen? I know I butchered that, but hey, I'm trying to hurry, all right? David is about to, to face Goliath. Everybody know this story? Do I need to do any background on it? Amen? Goliath, 
nine foot giant, David, a little kid, right? A teenager, basically. And he, he was coming up and he's going to face a giant when nobody else would. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? And David comes up and, the, and his brother kind of treats him like an older brother and just kind of yells at him and stuff. But David asked a question in this verse that's very familiar to a lot of people. David said, what have I done now? Or what have I now done? Listen to this question. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? How many of you know people that are wrapped up in causes? Amen? Uh, when I was growing up, it was save the well. Amen? Now, boy, you got causes after cause after cause. Amen? And you got people pouring millions of dollars and billions of dollars into causes. Amen? Of saving the planet. If they knew Jesus Christ was coming back, they wouldn't worry about it so much. Amen? Because he's going to put it, this uh, earth in the right order <laughs> with a flamethrower. But anyway, uh, let us pray real quick. Amen? Let us, uh, Father, we thank you for this night. Lord, I just ask you to bless this time that we have together. Uh, bless Brother Miller tonight as he comes and preaches for us. And Lord, as I just give this short challenge, Lord, would you be honored and glorified in all we do tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. How many of you know where Millersport, Ohio is? How many of you been to Sweet Corn Festival? Yeah, amen. That's where I grew up at. I graduated Millersport High School, amen. You say, but that's in the middle of nowhere. You got that right, amen. And, and, but I, that's where I grew up at. So what would cause a guy from Millersport, Ohio to go to all the way to Okinawa, Japan? That's a pretty big difference, isn't it? Pretty big jump, amen. And I've questioned myself over the years as many preachers have done. How can you sit in a church with the same Bible, the same Holy Spirit, the same Christ, the same God, and everybody walk out of here differently? The mystery of the church, amen? How can we hear a message and it affects one person one way and it affects another person another way? Boy, if I could get the answer to that, I'd be rich, amen? People would pay for that, wouldn't they? Amen. I'd be like, I'd be, wow, you know? And I sit here and I think about all those guys standing up on that, 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 that hill looking at the same giant David was looking at, looking at the same possibilities David was looking at. If I go down there, I'm going to get killed. Amen? He's going up against a warrior, somebody with combat experience, somebody with the right equipment. Uh, somebody that, that knew how to use his equipment and knew how to kill people. But this David, this little teenager, goes up against him and says, Today, you're done. Not because of my might, but because of the might of God Almighty. Amen? And then I go through the Bible and I think about, about uh, Joseph and wonder how in the world was Joseph able to do what he did. Amen? Go from the oppressors to start serving and, and literally saving them through a famine, amen? I think about the Hebrew children, amen, and how they were able to go in that fiery furnace with the attitude, God saves us, God saves us, but he says, don't, well, I'm better off anyway, amen? Or Daniel in the lion's den. Or Esther. Yeah, Esther didn't see it at first, but boy, once she saw it, she got it, didn't she? And I think about Paul, I think about Peter, I think about John. Great message last night, amen? Uh, I was here for part of the series. I, I, it's great about the apostles. Where they came from and where they, where they went to, amen? And I think about William Carey, amen? Uh, the, the, the missionary, the great missionary. I think about George Mueller. George, George Mueller cared for over 10,000 orphans. He established 117 schools that offered education to about 120,000 students. You know what George Mueller was accused of in, in England at that period of time? He was accused of raising the poor above their natural station. He was accused and, and, and ridiculed for giving people a chance at a better life. Isn't that something? And I think to myself, why do people act the way they do? Amen? Amen? I had six kids, so I'd like to answer that question too. Amen? <laughs> and I sit there and I think to myself, 
Why? I think I got a glimpse into it. I think God gave me something. Amen? And I don't know if it's right or not, but I'd just like to kind of share this with you and see what you think about it. Why were the apostles the way they were? Why were these prophets in the Old Testament the way they were? Why was David the way he was? Why did Pastor Stan Slayball, who I know he's sitting here. I'm not trying to get brownie points. You already support me. And, um, but he's a pretty smart guy. He married her. Amen, you know? All right. Why would Brother Miller give his 25 years in evangelism? Brother Fitzgerald. Fitzsimmons. I'm called Fitzsimmons. Fitzgerald's a whole lot easier. Fitzsimmons. 35 years in Haiti. That's, that's incredible. 32. Over 30 years older than me. But anyway, <laughs> and I think, why? Well, I think the question comes into David, is there not a cause? You see, people act a certain way when the cause becomes greater than themselves. Brother Yoder, you've been through some things. Why are you here tonight? You know? Brother Bob, you work all day. Why do you put all this time into this church? Because there's a cause that's greater than ourselves. You get it? And I think, why did Jesus Christ go onto the cross of Calvary to be spat upon, to be beaten, to be separated from His Father and go through all He did? You know why? Because you were a cause that was greater than himself. You get it? Why am I in Okinawa, Japan? Why does Pastor Slayball stand in this pulpit every week? Why does he do travel everywhere with kids? I got that one down, amen? You know, that that drive you crazy right there, amen? Why do we do these things? Because there's a cause that's greater than ourselves. Daniel and Chris Day the Jacobs, Leslie and Richard, Simon is a cause that's greater than myself. I get the privilege of going to Washington next month and hold my little grandson in my arms, and it's going to be a great moment. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Maryland holding my granddaughter in my arms. But you want to know something? I'm going back to Okinawa. You know why? Because there's a cause greater than myself. If this missions conference is going to be pleasing to God, then the cause that this mission co uh, conference represents has to be greater than Bible Baptist Church. Don't ask how much you should give towards mission. Ask how much you get to give towards missions. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. I don't have to travel all over America. I get to travel. What? Representing Christ. We don't have to be behind this pulpit. We get to be behind this pulpit. You get to go to a foreign country to reach people that these people cannot reach. It is a privilege and an honor to do that. But you know what else? It's a privilege and honor that Bible Baptist Church gets to go out to Grove City in Columbus, Ohio and reach people for the cause of Christ. Why? Because the cause is bigger than ourselves. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this time I've had. Father, I thank you for, for just the tentativeness of this church and the support they've been over the last uh, years, uh, the six years that we've been associated with them. My mother-in-law came here and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. My, my wife's cousin sat here and heard the gospel. I've had family members. I've got family members here tonight in the back row that are here tonight and can hear the gospel because the, your cause is greater than we are. So Lord, may you be honored, may you be glorified, and may you have the preeminence on all things done tonight, which in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. That little baby in the picture grew up, didn't he? And uh, amen. That's good. Well.
Looking forward to what Brother Miller has for us tonight, Brother Bob, and I think his sister Allison is going to sing for us. They're going to come, and uh, they'll sing the special, and then Brother Miller will come and preach to us this evening. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1, if you would, Acts chapter 1, and find verse 4, and uh, what a great day we had today, uh, Acts chapter 1, and find verse 4. It's so good to be here, and we're so thankful. Uh, we do travel in full-time evangelism, my wife and my children, and uh, we have two of them at college, but uh, uh, the two uh, younger ones are with us, and you say, some people ask this, uh, the first they say, well, that's a pretty big rig you got out there, and yes, and uh, uh, so do you live in it uh, all the time? Yes. So, so or some people just say, where do you live? I say, well, your parking lot right now. <laughs> uh, we have a plaque in our trailer, and it says, home is where you're level. <laughs> so as soon as we get level, we're home. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> We've been a lot of weird places, a lot of unique places, but it's great uh, to be able to go. And there is a cause greater than ourselves. And uh, so thankful for that. Uh, I want to mention, uh, pastors allowed us to put uh, several items uh, on the table in the uh, conference room there with the, the other missionaries and such, have tables and displays. 
And uh, we have uh, several things that can help you in your Christian life as well as being able to give out the gospel to others. Have you ever invited someone to church and they not show up? Uh, I think I hit a chord there, yes. Have you ever been burdened for someone uh, to give them the gospel but not get through the full gospel with them? Uh, well, uh, it was scenarios like that that drove our uh, burden to put not only in a gospel track type of a situation, but in a DVD form, uh, put the gospel on, uh, on video. And so this isn't a preaching, uh, but it is a, more of a documentary type style. We had a professional videographer for, uh, video me giving the gospel. And we have four different people uh, that share their testimony, uh, give their story on this DVD. And uh, there's three different tracks, but the main track uh, of the gospel presentation is under 10 minutes on purpose to be able to keep people uh, and their attention and, and such. One of the ladies that shares her uh, story, she was saved uh, just a, a couple of hours uh, or, or so uh, west of here in Ohio, and uh, she trusted Christ as Savior. She was Hindu from India. And uh, as soon as she, been, she responded in the morning service, and she came out uh, of the counseling room talking with the counselor, and, and uh, she came out beaming. She said, oh, Brother Miller, I want to be baptized. And this one, I said, wait, wait just a second. You understand that baptism doesn't wash away your sins. She said, oh, yes, I understand. I just trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, and he saved me, and I want everyone to know now I'm no longer Hindu, but I am now Christian. Isn't that great? The power of the gospel. Uh, there's a story of a man I thought could never be saved. He was so hard, so cold, so rough in his lifestyle, and he shares his story. Uh, there's another man in and out, in and out of prison uh, who uh, trusted Christ as Savior, another man uh, in uh, Florida, and he just thought you had to be good enough. You know, it's all works. Uh, you know what? Most people think that. It's a lie from Satan. But the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he shares his story of trusting Christ as Savior as well. So I want to encourage you to think about using these DVDs uh, to be able to give out to others. Uh, you can also open the back flap, and there's a funny-looking square. It's called a QR code, a quick response code. The young people know what to do with it. Just hand it to them. And uh, they'll take their phone, their device, they'll scan it. You can watch the video online uh, and, or on their device if they say they don't have a DVD player. So uh, I'd encourage you to think about these. Uh, one DVD is $5, uh, but if you get a pack of them, they immediately a pack of 10 would go down to $2 a piece. And uh, so we're really thankful that is a discounted price uh, even here recently. And uh, so think about someone, maybe 10 different people, that you could give the gospel to in this format. And I love a couple of different ways of doing it. One is to give them the DVD and say, would you watch this, and I'll check back with you in a week or two and see if they've watched it. And if they didn't get to in that time frame that you've given them, at least you keep the conversation open. And then you can answer any questions. Uh, one of our ladies in our church, um, it's a great soul winning couple, their family, and uh, she was burdened for the man who does a dry cleaning business. And uh, he's actually from Korea. Um, and he speaks, very, he speaks English better than he reads English. So she'd given him tracks, but he really didn't make any sense of it because he was really working through it. But he could understand spoken English because he's interacting every day with people for his business. And uh, so she said, hey, I got an idea. I'll give him that DVD. So she gave him the DVD, and uh, later she checked back, what, however long it was, and said, did you watch it? He said, yes, I did. Well, did you understand? Yes, I did. <laughs> did you trust Jesus Christ as Savior? Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> and it's great. So it's in Korean as well. I didn't realize it. Uh, it's actually just, just English. <laughs> but... Uh, but it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, you can use it in that way, but also, uh, I've had, uh, I just encourage people, young people, whatever, if you're scared or you don't know what to say, just say, hey, and it's someone perhaps you love, even a relative, say, would you sit down for 10 minutes and watch this with me? 
That's all I ask, just 10 minutes, watch this, and then we'll ask any questions and answer any questions you have from the Bible. It can be a way that you can use it as a tool. And so I encourage you with that. There's several other resources back there that will stir your heart for souls and for revival, and we need that because the truth is a revived church is going to be a missions church. It's going to be a church that's giving. It's going to be a church that's going. It's going to be a church that's praying. It's going to be a church that's actively a part in God's plan for worldwide evangelism. We can't skip the part of being revived. God's plan is that. In Acts chapter 1, would you look there in verse 4? Acts chapter 1 and find verse 4. The Bible says here in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, what's the next word? Wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. Uh, skip, if you would, to verse 8. What is this promise? But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God's plan is to revive the church. We see him saying, wait to the disciples. The angels come afterwards, and they say, why stand ye gazing up into heaven as Jesus has just ascended up into the clouds? Then we see the disciples leaving there and waiting. How did they wait? Well, how did this first, this uh, power and uh, heartbeat for worldwide evangelism and spreading the gospel begin? It began like this, in a prayer meeting. As they gathered together, last night we talked about the people in the prayer meeting and recognized that the people in that prayer meeting are just like you and me. They've messed up, but they got God's mercy, and God answered their request. Tonight, we're going to see the second element that they had in that prayer meeting, and it's the same for us. It's God's plan. What was God's plan? You say, well, it was Pentecost. Yes, and much more. Pentecost is the idea of first fruits. It's a feast of first fruits. The idea is the first fruits is just a sample of, of more to come. You see, what took place in Acts chapter 1 is they were waiting on the Father uh, for the Father's promise and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit through a prayer meeting. And then look at chapter 2, and uh, we'll skip all the way down, if you would, uh, to verse 41. After the day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Spirit, and uh, look, if you would, at verse 41, Acts 2 and verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day uh, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I told you you should have preached tonight. And uh, <laughs> I told my brother over here, I said, when I point to you, you come up and you get the message. <laughs> and uh, so it's 3,000 people saved. You say, wow, that's wonderful, but that was just Pentecost. That was just one time. Do you realize this was repeated? Look at Acts chapter 4 and find verse 4. Acts 4 and verse 4. It says this, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. You know what? The power of the Holy Spirit, this great uh, demonstration of revival, is taking place more than one time. God's plan is this, is to initiate revival... You respond to his initiation of revival. God revives you individually through the Holy Spirit. He fills you personally, individually. As you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's then him, his life flowing through you, reviving you, and living out the very life of Jesus Christ in you. When he says walk in newness of life, it's not talking about your life. When we're revived, it's not your life revived it is life again, but it's not yours. It is divine life from the Spirit of God living out Jesus Christ literally and actually in you. Well, what about what took place at Pentecost? This is referred to as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He says in chapter 2 and verse 16, 17, and 18, it says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
He, and it explains what has taken place. What was taking place? What was taking place was the Holy Spirit was coming in such a way, but not just one person was in, revived, but the entire congregation was revived. But isn't it interesting, in God's plan for revival to reach this world, he said in Acts 1, but wait. Why did he say to wait? Here's the answer. Because they were not ready. Why, did he say, why does he say to you, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power? Because you're not ready. The most frustrating thing would be is to try to be a witness, reach the world, have a part in missions on your own with a self-effort. Oh, it would be such a drudgery to give one's finances. It would be such a, just go on soul winning just because it's a guilt trip. You wanna, don't want to feel guilty. And, and this is such a struggle. But when you are revived through the Spirit of God, it is His life and His light shining through you. They were not ready, we are not ready, until we deal with self. Self must be dealt with. There is a cause greater than my self. Um, what, ha what is taking place? What's hiding the power and the light of the gospel from us? Uh, let me get my son Jonathan to come up. Jonathan, would you come up? And uh, just stand up here. Uh, let's say Jonathan uh, here is a young man. He's 14. And you've trusted Christ as Savior as re already as, as your Savior. You know what? We'll go down here. Let's do this. Hopefully you can still see him. Okay. And uh, we'll put Jonathan down here. And uh, uh, Jonathan trusted Christ as Savior. When someone trusts Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside him. Joseph, would you come? And he'll represent the Holy Spirit uh, coming inside. And go ahead and turn on the the light there, and we're going to have uh, the light represent the power and the light of the Holy Spirit that's now in him. Now, immediately when he is saved, wow, what does someone, a lot of times when they trust Christ as Savior, they say immediately they want to take that light to other people. They want, hey, my relative needs to see this. My dad needs to see this. My wife needs to hear this. Oh, and they immediately, there's nothing um, stopping them they want to immediately tell the gospel to others. But somewhere along the line, self creeps in. And the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit is hidden because of self. We have Jonathan here. Can I introduce you to Jonathan's self? Jonathan, could you help me out? I, here's Jonathan's big self. Would you come and stand right here? Now, when self gets in the way, <laughs> can, can you see the light? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and let me tell you, that's a pretty big battle with self, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's a big, hard battle. Man, the light's still there. <laughs> but whenever the Holy Spirit's trying to hand the light forward and, and the Jonathan says, yes, I need to be filled with the Spirit. Yes, I want, I want to go tell other people about Jesus. I do want to reach the world. I want to have a part in missions. And as he goes back, he's got self blocking the way. <laughs> self must be dealt with. Wait, why? Because you're not ready. I, I remember in um, college and even years after Bible college of praying and asking God, would you give such a, a, a reviving, like the Great Awakenings, that we've experienced in our country's history? And I would be praying that way, and powerful, sweeping revival would take, come across our, our churches in our country where thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of people would trust Christ as Savior. That type of awakening. And you know who I kind of saw as leading the pack, kind of leading it all, was... Dun, da, da. Evangelist Chris Miller. You know? <laughs> I'm like, all right. 
And I wonder, Lord, why am I having such a hard time even seeing one or two saved? The reason is, you're not ready. You know, still even now, I believe God is getting me ready for greater works. But there's something Chris Miller has to deal with every single day in itself. We've got to get this self out of the way. Would you go have a seat again? (laughs) And now with self out of the way, the Holy Spirit has no problem shining through the believer, and he then is that light to the world. What's stopping the power of the Holy Spirit and the effective ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life What's stopping you personally from being revived? This church corporately of being revived. It is dealing with self. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Look at Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, what do we see? We see this incredible description of this church here. And look, if you would, in chapter 2, verse 42. Chapter 2, verse 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, to eat their meat with gladness and with singleness of heart. What do we see? We see a unity there, a group that is void of self. Now God can use them. Now you can pray for revival, and you can pray for missions and worldwide evangelism, but it sure would make a difference if someone else would join you. And then it would make a much bigger difference if an entire revived church is gathering together and having a prayer meeting. You know what? You pray a lot different when you gather together with God's people than when you're at your home by yourself. Do you realize that? There is a difference. There is a reason why we have church. There is a reason why we gather together. Notice the phrase, with one accord. In Acts 1, verse 14, it says, And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh, We see this one accord throughout many passages of Scripture, even chapter 4 and uh, verse 24. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice with one accord. Here it is, this unity. It's one mind, one passion, one purpose. They're coming together. Not only do we see this one accord, we see fellowship. We see the fellowship mentioned in, uh, in verse uh, 43, where is it? Verse 42, chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now for us Baptists, we think that means food. Uh, but it actually means the idea of communion, of two walking together, of having a fellowship, of, 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 uh, of being able to enjoy each other and focus on others and helping that person. But then they were doing this with gladness. And then in verse 46, it uses the word singleness of heart. Do you see, and this means the idea of simplicity. It's a compound word where the latter part of it is the the idea of making your foot to stumble. But the first part is negative. So it's you're not causing others to stumble. But with such a simplicity and a singleness of mind, a singleness of heart, You're all working together. One passion to reach the world. One mind. Self is gone. What do we need to deal with in self? That would stop the one accord, the fellowship and communion, and the singleness of mind. Self will, self love, and self focus. Those three areas must be dealt with. Self will. Would you take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12 and find verse 24. John chapter 12 and find verse 24. Self will must be dealt with. Self will. 
Notice in John chapter 12, verse 24, he uses the example of a seed going into the ground. It's called a corn of wheat or a seed or grain of wheat. John 12, 24 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is an illustration of a grain of wheat, one seed going into the ground. That grain has an outer shell. The germ, the life of that seed is always within the seed, but will never take root or sprout up with that life until the outer shell is separated, dies. Death always means separation. The illustration is the illustration of dying to self, that outer self-will that will block the light to be able to shine through us, that will block what the Holy Spirit wants to do. God is right inside of you. You have everything you need to live the Christian life and to reach this world, but you're blocking this light because of self-will. The seed says, no, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be a seed. I'm a good seed. I love being a seed. But the farmer says, no, there's something much better is planned for you. You're going to become a plant. And from you, there are going to be many uh, kernels of grain. Could be scores, perhaps even to 100 on one just stalk of wheat from this one seed. It it'll bring much fruit, but if it doesn't die, it abides or remains alone. It remains alone. When we say, dear God, would you deal with my self-will? Then we start to break that outer shell. That germ of life from that seed can now sprout, take root, and it can grow. Would you say, dear God, I need to give up self-will? What does God want you to do with your life? Well, I don't know if I want to do this, or I don't want to do that, or I want to do... Do you hear yourself talk? Is it all what you want to do, or have you said, dear God, I am willing to do whatever you want me to do? But it's not just a directional decision of your life or your vocation or your um, main direction in life. This is a daily decision of self-will. How much are you dying to self-will? When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, will you obey? If not, you abide alone. But if you die, you can bring much fruit. God wants to do that hundredfold, that 200-fold, that 300-fold, where we can have explosive, dynamic, evangelistic growth because of the Holy Spirit. But self-will stops. And not only does self-will stop us, but also there's self-love. Look at verse 25. It says this, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. The, the word for life is actually soul. He that hates his soul. It's my life. It's the natural man. You see, every day you have a choice of your life and the natural man or the spirit of God in you as a Christian, the spiritual life. One missionary was heading to the Fiji Islands where cannibals were. He asked the captain of a ship to be able to guide him and take his crew, whoever was going to go with him, to go minister as missionaries to the Fiji Islands. He said, you're crazy. You will lose your life there. They're cannibals. You will die. And he looked at him and he said, we died before we ever left. Died to self. Self-love. What is it that you love more than God? What is it that you love more than souls? What is it that you love more than what God wants to put in your life? We have self-will, but we also have self-love. You know, it's amazing that the Bible talks about money so much. 
You know, your spiritual life is connected with money in a very detailed way. We can tell where your heart is. Oh, you say, no, 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 you just can't. Where's your heart? Your heart does not lead your treasure, but your heart follows your treasure. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, when I give to a ministry, I'm more burdened for that ministry. When I give to a missionary, I'm more burdened for that specific mi missionary, and I pray for that one. You ought to be giving. Is money the root of all evil? No. But the love of money is. As this love and greed for this monetary system, this ma mammon, be becomes so entrenched in you that you can't let go. You know, in the, the Acts chapter 2, doesn't it kind of scare us when you, you see that they sold all the possessions and everything was common? Now, the guy, the God does not give that description for us right now to go sell your house, sell your car, and you own absolutely nothing, and we're going to all just put it in one big pool. <laughs> Yo, <whew. laughs> but what is it that would stop us from giving? Self-love. It's that love for that monetary thing or that monetary system. You know what? You ought to give. Your spouse, you ought to give. Your children ought to give. Teach your children to be givers. Um, we've, uh, uh, many times we've just told our kids what we're going to give. We say, well, you shouldn't do that. Well, we wanted them to be a part of it. Uh, God was working in our heart, and uh, we were praying for a um, miraculous thing. We were praying for a new truck, a brand new truck. And, um, and I said, okay, Lord, I'll pray for it. And I got a clear conviction. I was, pray I was praying before that just for our old truck to be fixed and repaired. It had so many problems. And I, and I was praying for that one to be repaired again. The Lord convicted me, no, you need to pray for a new truck. I said, okay, I'll pray for a new truck. Here's my one condition. <laughs> That'll be 100% paid for. We had never owned anything new and we know, you know, um, everything we own is depreciating in value. <laughs> we don't own a truck and trailer because that's a good investment. No, no, it's a bad investment. I understand. In fact, I haven't been in evangelism or ministry for 25 years. It's only been 24. So I just want to correct that one. I want to exaggerate. <laughs> so we've been through three trucks, three trailers and such. And, uh, and none of them are great investments. Why do you do it? Here's why I do it. Because they're not financial investments, but they're family investments. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose my children. They all minister and they serve together, and we're all part of the ministry. My wife so willingly uh, turns down a regular home to be able to follow me in my calling as an evangelist. We were praying for a truck and, and asking the Lord to provide for it, and uh, it was incredible. Uh, the Lord was putting me really to the test to say, okay, if you trust me, don't tell anybody about it. Now, there's times we might send out a letter and ask people to pray for a project. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but God gave me no clearance to do that. Don't send a letter. I thought, well, maybe I can call some people. Hey, how you doing? Would you pray for us? We need a new truck. And uh, no, God wouldn't let me pray for, uh, call anybody. He said, if you trust me, just pray. One gift after another is incredible. We then sold our old truck, and we were getting ready to leave summer camp ministry, and we had like three weeks left, and we had no truck still. And we were still deficit of like $3,500, maybe $4,000. And we had a particular amount that we, were, uh, that we were saved for. We had one truck that we saw east of the Mississippi that was low enough uh, and fit, fit our needs, and we saw that's the one, but we still need like $4,000 towards it. And God said, okay, I told you that. Trust me. You trust? Yes. Okay, now don't tell anybody, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to give a certain amount of money away. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> Lord, we need, we need more money for the truck. If we give more money away, then we have less money. No, no, no. In God's economy... You give it away, 
to give more. So he said, okay. So he told our kids about it. Man, we started giving. Man, we just, it was so exciting. Let's give this much to this ministry or this one. We'll surprise somebody. We'll do it anonymous for this one over here. And it was just so exciting. And then the, the thrill when we drove the new truck home and our kids came running out of the trailer and they say, look, <laughs> look at the truck that God provided. Look at the truck that God provided. You know, we can trust God with our giving. Your kids need to do that. You children here and teenagers, you got some money? <laughs> Trust God with it. You can do that. God put on our heart a certain amount to give uh, this last year, and I said, okay, we're going to give a certain amount, but I want to, this is above tithes and, and regular uh, giving to our church. And, and I said, uh, but God impressed me to give a certain amount to our kids and say, you give this amount to any ministry, you pray and let God lead you. Isn't that important? You pray and let God lead you to tell you who to give this to, but also do this, add to it. How much? That's up to you. Listen to God. Man, it was exciting. You know, my son Jonathan gave his to missionaries in Cameroon. <laughs> Guess where he wants to go be a missionary to Joseph gave it to a church planner in Iowa. And they added to it their own finances. Can you trust God? Do we have this self-love that's gripping onto our finances? We say, dear Lord, would you lead me and guide me? God's good. He'll guide you. He'll show you, and then he'll provide. The giver always has enough to keep on giving because the law of sowing and reaping God will never fall short to that. There's self-will, self-love, but finally, self-focus. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Self-focus moved to others-focused. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The only way we can have our self-focus moved to it, others' focus, is to have the mind of Christ in us. We're naturally just thinking about self, naturally just focused right on us, what we can do. Would you tonight say, dear God, help me with self. The whole reason they had to wait is because they were not ready, <laughs> because self was still blocking the light. Self-will, I want to do this. Self-love, this is mine. Self-focus, I don't care about that. I'm focused on my agenda, my needs, where I'm going. Lift up your eyes and look. Have a focus on other people and see your life is meant to be serve, serving others. That's what it's all about. Are you full of self? What has to be done with self? It has to break, separate, die to self. This, remember the story of Gideon? And he took the pitcher, and he, inside the pitcher, he, he put the flame or the torch. In the other hand, so that was in the left hand, I believe. In the right hand, he took the trumpet. He said, when I say the sword of the Lord of Gideon and blow my trumpet, then you blow your trumpets and call out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they did that, and they began to charge 300 men down the hillside towards 180,000 troops. 300 against 180,000. It's incredible. How did they do it? They blew the trumpets. 
when they started off, though, the torches were inside the pitchers. What had to happen to the pitchers? They had to be what? Broken. You see, the pitcher is made of clay, earthen vessel. It typifies or signifies us as humans. Us. The fire inside is significant in illustrating the fire of the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit within us. You see, the pitcher held the fire. What? Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost? The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. It held the fire. But that same pitcher that held the fire hid the fire. What had to happen? That pitcher had to be broken. You have to smash it. Don't let any pieces there. Don't let any, no, no, no. It had to be broken. It's just hiding the fire. Why is this world not seeing the gospel light? Why is it not where we're not winning more souls? We're seeing the power of the Holy Spirit like in the book of Acts is because self is blocking the way. Break that picture tonight. Dear God, I want to be broken of self-will. Oh, I fight this every day. God, self-love, this is mine. No, Lord, it's all yours. Self-focus. God, make me and bring my eyes off of myself and focus on serving others. Will you tonight say, dear God, would you break me of myself? Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help. Lord, would you do your work in, your heart, in our hearts and our lives? Lord, continue to do your work in my heart and my life so I can have the power and see the light of the Holy Spirit shining through me in a greater way. Lord, do that with our brothers and sisters right now as well. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, if you're here tonight and say, Brother Miller, God's spoken to my heart. I do need to be broken of self. I see the reason I'm not the witness I need to be, the reason I'm not seeing the power of the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit, is because self-will is there. Self-love is there. Self-focus is there. If God has spoken to you, would you tonight, in just a moment, step out and pray about that? Would you do that? Everyone standing, let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help right now with each one. I ask that you'd help us to respond to you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, God's spoken to you as the pianist plays. Would you come tonight, right now? Would you come just right now? Respond to the Lord. Say, dear God, I need to be broken of self-will, of self-love, of self-focus.